Good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to UCSF Family and Community Medicine Grand Rounds. We have a fantastic speaker today, um, who is Dr. Tricia Elliott, and I'm really excited to hear her talk. Um, but before we get started, just a few sort of housekeeping reminders. Just wanted to let everybody know that um, first off, the session is being recorded. Um, and uh, it will be posted uh, after, after today's session on our Family Medicine website. So if you missed prior Grand Rounds or you just want to review this one, um, uh, you can check us out there. We're also on YouTube. Um, uh, also, this is a webinar style today. So we'll be using the, the Q&A section for questions. If you do have questions, please type them in and we will do our best to either, uh, to either answer them live uh, with Dr. Elliott or respond to them um, in the in the text for you. Um, there's also going to be an evaluation form uh, in the Q&A session that hopefully Roy will post up there for us, um, which helps us get feedback on this session and ideas for future sessions. So as always, we encourage you to fill that out. Um, and also before we start, I want to thank uh, our terrific tech team who is making this possible today. Um, that's Benjamin and Roy, and we really appreciate your help as always. Um, and uh, with no further ado, I want to help us get started and warmly welcome our speaker today, who's Dr. Tricia Elliott. Um, Dr. Elliott graduated from Rice University and received her medical degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch. She completed her residency in family medicine at Albert Einstein in Montefiore um, in social medicine. Uh, Dr. Elliott is the immediate past president of the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine, which is fantastic. That is a huge achievement. And a past president of the uh, uh, and board chair of the Texas Academy of Family Physicians. She has over 20 years of graduate medical experience, which includes nationally recognized work with the ACGME Family Medicine Milestones Group, the American Family uh, Physicians Council on Education, the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine, and more. Um, she's provided administrative and clinical leadership across various types of healthcare system, systems, including academic medical centers, a multi-specialty group practice, a community-based university-affiliated teaching hospital. Um, she's been in the roles of clinical faculty, program director, vice chair for clinical affairs. She's done everything. It's I'm cutting her CV short only for time. It's really um, impressive. She's currently serving as the senior vice president of medical staff, academic and research um, uh, and uh, at uh, and DIO at the JPS Health Network in Fort Worth, Texas. She's a professor of family medicine at Texas Christian University and the University of North Texas uh, Health Centers uh, of in the School of Medicine, as well as other appointments. The list just goes on and on um, for her achievements. So I feel so deeply honored that she's come to talk to us about this topic today. Um, the title of the session is Addressing Racism and Advancing Health Equity in and Beyond the Exam Room. Uh, racism and the repeated trauma of experiencing racism has a direct impact um, on health and detrimental effects on our individual patients, our communities, our society. In primary care, we're poised to lead action and meaningful anti-racism change because we understand our patients, not just in terms of their pathophysiology, but also in terms of their relationships, their experiences, their communities, and their social contexts. Um, today with Dr. Elliott, we will discuss actions that we can take in our own practices with our own patients, communities, and even beyond to address racism, advance health equity, and bring about change and promote justice. Thank you so much, Dr. Elliott, for being here. I want to warmly welcome you and um, let you get started in your talk. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Venner. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I also want to thank Dr. Grumbaugh, too. Uh, looked up to him for so many years, and it's just been an honor to be able to be here today too. So without any further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, we're gonna have a conversation uh, around how do we actually address racism and advance health equity, and what do we need to do in the exam room and even beyond the exam room, and what we can do in the primary care world to be able to do this as family medicine clinicians. So just to be clear, I have no disclosures or conflicts. So what are we going to focus on? Well, let's talk a little bit about systemic racism and its impact on health, health outcomes, and health equity. We'll just do a little broad overview there. We'll also talk about some resources and processes maybe that you want to incorporate so you can actually address experiences of racism with your patients and actually also address social determinants of health and how we actually reduce some health inequities in our own communities and practices. And then I'll give you some tools that I like to talk about at the best practices in primary care of how you do this beyond the exam room in terms of these partnerships and other things we may wanna to do to be able to advance health equity and promote social justice in healthcare. 
So why are we even here? And why are we having these conversations? Well, we all know, unfortunately, I can't sum up 400 years of history in just a few minutes in terms of understanding that the racial and social impacts of economics and the policies established, but we're gonna go ahead and have a conversation, move hopefully into a little deeper conversation and hopefully a call to action. The events of 2020 definitely charged us all in America to look at how we historically and currently deal with race, and especially even how we do, do that in healthcare and in medicine specifically. With the murder of George Floyd and other black Americans at the hands of police last year, and then also with COVID-19, highlighting the existing health disparities that we already knew were here in our healthcare system. So now we're at a call to action. And as you can see, this is our time to absolutely make this change. Martin Luther King told us many years ago, and this is over 50 plus years ago, but here we are, that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And it's just really unfortunate that we see that this pervades even to this day, that racism, discrimination, implicit bias, and structural inequalities that we see in structural racism here, they have substantially impacted how we deliver healthcare and the outcomes that we do see in our patients and our communities. So we wanna do some things to be able to address that, but we have to understand context and we have to understand some things around race and racism. So let's define race. So race is a social, political and power construct. It's based on skin color and other physical differences. It is actually has no genetic basis or no biological basis whatsoever. It can be different in different societies of how we define that. There's actually more genetic variation within any given race or ethnic group than actually between races and um, other races and ethnicities. So we have to understand the power dynamic and how it's set up because that's what drives in terms of racism. And racism is that belief and that system that has been formulated that different races possess distinct characteristics, abilities, or behaviors, or qualities that actually will distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another. It truly is a power construct. So it's a construct there basically to make one group feel inferior and one group feel superior. Now, as we drive even further, we look at how we have set up certain institutional structures and systemic structures and establish structures, patterns, policies, and practices that perpetuate racism throughout. And it basically is that system that unfortunately consistently penalizes and denies the rights or benefits of people based on their race, culture, or ethnic origin. And unfortunately, it routinely produces inequitable outcomes. So how do we combat this? Well, right now you've been hearing a lot of talk about not just being not racist, but how are we anti-racist? And that's where we wanna really move, even in healthcare as uh, physicians and clinicians doing this work. So anti-racism is that process where we're gonna be actively identifying and opposing racism. And our goal is to challenge it at all levels. We have to challenge it in our own systems of healthcare. And we have to actively change policies, behaviors, and beliefs that perpetuate these ideas of racism and these actions. And it's hard work. I'm not gonna deny that, you know, that this is easy. I'm not gonna say that this is easy. This is truly difficult work, but it's worthwhile and it takes everybody at the table to do this work. Just real quickly, uh, just letting you know, there's some things there just to, that kind of led us to this point. And it's important for us to know our history. The more you know of your history, the more liberated you are. That's a quote from Maya Angelou that I absolutely love. And I'll just urge you, if you can take some time to understand some of that history, the 1619 Project is an excellent project around that history of race, but also understanding where racism has fit in medicine specifically. Medical apartheid, the medical bondage of understanding the dangerous and brutal experimentation on different people over the many centuries that have led to where we are that has continually racialized medicine and moved us forward into this way and where racism fits within that. I won't get into all of the details around that, but I think it is important to understand that, understand how health inequity has been set up by economics, such as things as redlining that occurred in 1930s, where African Americans were denied the ability to own homes. And we understand that home ownership is one of the biggest components of wealth. And unfortunately, century later, we're still dealing with the effects of those inequities. So a few more definitions here, health disparity and health equity. So let's talk about health disparities. Well, health disparities, the key thing there is understanding that these are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health. 
Achieving health equity requires valuing everyone equally with a focus on ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities. And so we really do believe that we are trying to achieve equity for all. That is achieving the highest level of health for all people. And in that, we also have to address healthcare disparities. Healthcare disparities is when we have those differences between groups in the quality of healthcare that we are providing. And that can be related to the access to that care, coverage for that care, uh, as we look at the way we pay for that care, clinical needs, preferences, and of the appropriateness of those interventions. And so we have to thoughtfully look at all these aspects as we look forward. This is just another way, a schematic of being able to look at how health equity is, de is defined. And I really like this, is that opportunity for everyone to attain his or her full health potential. It's not about equality. It's not about providing the same thing to everyone to be able to achieve health, the highest health for themselves, but it's about making sure that we provide what's needed for that individual to actually achieve their highest uh, full health. So I like to think about it in this way, it's about providing the right shoe that fits that right that individual. And we know what the reality is, is that we are all coming, there are different advantages and disadvantages for all groups. And it's not about everyone having the equal um, opportunity, but how do we achieve equity and giving everyone what they need to be healthy. So just a few things just to highlight as we've been seeing this, a lot of us have seen these already and knowing some of these statistics out there in terms of health disparities, but just as a reminder that these are real numbers. These are real things that are happening in our own practices here. We look at things around maternal mortality. The unfortunate thing is that maternal mortality on a global um, scale has actually declined nearly 38%. But unfortunately in the same period of time over the last 20 years or so, it's actually increased for African-American women by 26%. This is significant to see that they're three times actually more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than other women. So those are things we know that we can see and we're looking at very closely. Heart disease, that's also important in terms of cardiovascular interventions, um, transplants, all these things is that we know that unfortunately um, people of color and particularly even black women receive um, less interventions around this. And so these are things we're looking at. Latinos have a lower um, death rate overall uh, for diabetes. Um, I'm sorry, a lower, um, have a lower death rate overall, but a 50% higher death rate from diabetes and 24% more poorly controlled high blood pressure. So these are things we always wanna make sure that we're looking at closely. HIV AIDS, we know how that disproportionately affects certain populations. Colon cancer also disproportionately affects certain populations also. And then of course, looking at breast cancer too. So, and just recently just recognizing that COVID has now highlighted to us also this disparity that we see. So it's been here, but it's also being now evident in other ways now throughout our healthcare system. So people of color, unfortunately here in COVID, we see unfortunately that they have higher rates of infection, hospitalization and death due to COVID. And I know all of us have seen this across all of our areas. I'm here in Texas and we're definitely seeing this is very much playing out here. And so we have to recognize that this goes deeper. We have to understand the issues around race. We have to understand structural racism. We have to understand the issues of social determinants of health. We have to figure out ways to have these conversations and to actually put in some, put some things in place to be able to address this overall, not just for this particular disease, but for all of the areas of disparities that we're seeing in healthcare. All right, so we've talked a few definitions, kind of talked a little bit about where we are and why we're here. I think one of the things I kept hearing about as I've been doing this work is understanding, well, this is happening in the world, but how do I have these conversations with my patients? Do I need to have these conversations around racism, around social determinants of health, around health inequities? And I would say and urge you to say yes. I know they're difficult conversations, but there are ways that we can have these conversations. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that's important and how to do that. So I wanna thank Dr. Venner for uh, providing this. I was so impressed to hear that you actually have this in one of your waiting rooms there. The fact that you actually even create the safe place and the open conversation to say, hey, um, to your patients, racism does happen everywhere. And it's our job to eliminate racism. We wanna hear from you and wanna talk about it. But I can also understand this can be a little daunting, not only for the patient to open up those conversations, but it probably is also daunting for um, us as physicians and clinicians doing this work to have these conversations. So how do we even broach the topic and have this? And where do we even start in our whole structure? So let's talk about where we start. 
So uh, I started you a little bit with the first part of where we start. It's kind of knowing the history of structural racism. Now I just gave you one of the briefest overviews and just some sense of some resources out there, but I will tell you the first place in starting anything for our patients is knowing the history of structural racism. And coming from a place where that we understand that even within healthcare, where this fits and how race has also played a role and racializing medicine has also played a role. But it's important to understand that, do your best to do that and understand that. Knowing and training ourselves, we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like and then what we need to do for ourselves to prepare ourselves for this. And then knowing our community itself, right? And what we're doing in our own community and what those resources are and the history of that community. And then I would urge you also to get to know your team. How do we create some transparency and some conversations within our teams and understand who our teams are? And then I would say, what do we do in that room to make this conversation and more explicit and implicit, implicit and explicit? So let's talk a little bit. So the first step I said, know the history of structural racism. Mentioned to you that doing your research around racism in medicine and uh, racism in research, genomics and ancestry, that's also important. So do your best to be able to have those conversations and know where some of those triggers may lie that you may see. Then I would say also knowing and training yourself and ourselves here and knowing in terms of how racial identity is developed and doing a little research on that, but also understanding the role of racialization versus self-identification. We are not usually aware of the fact that we actually, um, racialization is something where it's an external perception, an external perception that's put upon certain groups of people, as opposed to that empowerment of self-identifying. And unfortunately, that racialization is what sets up that perpetual racism within our context there. And so it's important for us to be able to empower our patients to self-identify, to be able to acknowledge who they are, and to be able to affirm them in their space and who they, and who they are. And then, of course, I think also doing your own um, uh, reflections of yourself in terms of your own implicit biases. Uh, many of us are already aware of the implicit bias testings that are out there, and it's important you can engage in many of that. But it's important that all of us, um, ourselves, our teams, actually actually have these conversations and really acknowledge our own implicit bias. I've done that with myself. I've actually shared stories of my own biases that I've had to face with my own patients. Um, some of them, you know, a bit humorous as I try to think about it for myself, and some of them pretty serious that I've had to kind of reflect upon and my own experience of racism that have led me to those kind of biases and that I've had to work through. The key is to know your bias, it's to be able to be able to change and to be able to not act upon that and to be able to reflect on that. We all have biases and it's, it's recognized, it's recognizing it. And then shifting from just cultural competency to a framework of cultural humility. And now what that means is that Basically, cultural competence is loosely defined as the ability to engage in understanding people across cultures. So it's just the knowledge and making sure that you're competent in understanding those factors across cultures. But that's not where we should stop, because we want to be able to shift to more a cultural humility context and framework. And what that is, is it says it's a commitment to understanding a lifelong understanding and process of self-reflection and personal critique and acknowledging your own bias and continually evolving in how we understand culture, understanding how we understand the intersectionality of identities and the ongoing uh, complexity of that and being uh, someone then and a clinician that actually um, is not, we will never fully be competent, but we're always growing as lifelong learners. And that's where we want to shift ourselves to. And then I would say, know your community's history and your resources. Social determinants of health, uh, we'll talk more about that in a second and where we can also embed that into our practice and into um, our encounters. But it's important to understand that. And then also investing in your community, getting to know your community and those resources within your community and know the cultural capital in your community. Walk your community, talk with your community partners and those leaders in your community. That's so important. They can be such a resource for us and then we can connect our patients to all of these resources. I often give the example when I was working in Galveston, I was so impressed when I got there and I was able to meet with certain community leaders and partners because I recognized there was an organization that was very well, well uh, established uh, of community leaders. They call themselves the Galveston Island Community Research Advisory Committee. 
and their whole goal was gate being gatekeepers for health and well-being among African Americans in Galveston, meaning that any community-based participatory research that occurred in that community had to go through them. and They had to be a part of it. You couldn't apply for a grant or anything else without engaging them if they were going to be a part of that. And I just love that empowerment of understanding that investment in the community and that um, community taking that because there was a history that they wanted to make sure it was not repeated. Also, I would say know your team, right? And so acknowledge, like you said, be open about those implicit biases, create that transparency, allow your team to have those conversations, center those voices and views. Those huddles that you have with your team, create a space for how are you feeling? If there are certain things that are happening in the media right now or occurring in the community or other things like that or with patients that you're seeing, make sure in those huddles you create spaces to say, how are you feeling about that now? How is this impacting your ability to be here right now? Right now, even with COVID, we're trying to do some of those things right now to be able to have those conversations around well-being and those impacts on our team. So make sure there's space to know your team and what their experience is and also leverage the experience of your team. Oftentimes you'll have people on your team who are very embedded within the community and people in the community will look to them for being that voice. And so it's important to know who they are and what they do beyond our, our own clinic. And then in the, in the exam room, make the implicit explicit. So create that safe and welcoming environment. Celebrate the identity culture. If you, you know, think about the Black Lives Matter flag or um, a pride flag or whatever it is, is you want to do, make sure that there are languages that are reflected that reflect your community. And I'm going to tell you also the other thing is make sure that you've got staff and people on your team that reflect your community, okay, at all levels. Right. And so making sure that you're creating that safe and welcoming environment is so critical. I love the fact, like I said, you have that sign there. Um, that's a great opening um, way to say that we are welcoming everyone. We want to have these conversations and then ask the questions. We'll talk a little bit about that. And sometimes those questions are, I don't want to assume anything about your identity, but how do you identify yourself? What's your that's the way you identify racially. If you do, how do you identify yourself culturally? What are your pronouns? How would you like me to be a part of your healthcare? How can we partner? Uh, and then I would say even opening the door to that sign that you have there. Many of my patients experience racism in healthcare. They've experienced racism throughout their lives and experiences. Are there any experiences you would love to share with me and like to share with me? Because I'd like to partner with you in that because I know that racism does impact our health overall. And we are here to help you be the healthiest you can be. And so those are kind of things you can do to be able to ask the questions. But as you're asking the questions, make sure you're bearing witness with authenticity. Listen, listen to understand, not listening to change, all right? We're listening to understand. And it's just really those things. And we'll talk a little bit about things you can do to say, I'm listening to understand. And then I would say, make sure that you're looking at what you're doing, measuring your own practices, measuring your own um, institutions, departments, um, all of that. Plan, do, study, act. How are you doing in these areas of racial equity? Measure it, evaluate it, talk about it. Make sure that you are sharing that and you're being transparent about, transparent about it. Don't assume that you're already there, right? Make sure we're continually having those conversations. So I, I had to make sure that we had a little conversation to why this is important to bring this into the exam room, right? Why is it important for us to have these conversations? Well, I think we can all agree that this does impact health. It impacts mind, body, spirit, our whole health. It impacts it. And there is history and generational trauma that unfortunately uh, has affected where we are today. And we have to recognize that for our patients, that historical and generational trauma for whatever group of patients we are dealing with and caring for. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this and I wanna thank my uh, colleague, on my team, Dr. Glenda Mutinda, who's one of my director for interprofessional well-being. And we've been having these conversations because we've been trying to do some of this work also in caring for our caregivers uh, and understanding the historical and generational trauma they're bringing and how do we help them process that as they're caring for patients. But then we have to understand that in the context for our patients also. So historical trauma are those traumatic experiences or events that a group of people may have shared within a society, right? Or in a community or um, in a national group. So some of those examples are like 9-11, uh, uh, things like that could be, um, be uh, considered in that way. 
The other thing, and now COVID-19, the other thing you're done is also intergenerational or generational trauma. And this is trauma that gets passed down from those who have directly experienced it at a point from an incident. And then it passes on to subsequent generations. And so this could be things like we've heard about the Tuskegee experiment. That was something that was maybe a historical trauma, but now has become an intergenerational and generational trauma that has built up distrust or mistrust. And so it's passed down to subsequent generations, such as also the Holocaust, a historical, deeply historical trauma that is also now an intergenerational generational trauma. So we have to understand that that is a continuum sometimes and we need to recognize it to be able to have those conversations. And the reason we wanna talk about it is because it can definitely manifest in illness and it can manifest in, um, in the way that we are able to achieve health and to be able to engage within our healthcare system and with others. So on an individual level, that impact we can see sometimes in our patients from depression, anxiety, anger. Sometimes we may see self-destructive behaviors, alcohol abuse, um, other um, substance abuse, uh, low self-esteem. The other thing is we often are seeing too is also some post-traumatic stress and that hit that impact of that. And so being able to talk about that is going to be important. And that's where also racism also plays a role in that, and that repeated, repeated experiences of either macro or microaggressions or just certain experiences may also trigger some of these kind of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. On a community level, what we may see in terms of historical and generational trauma is a sense of unresolved grief. So there is a community that is holding on and has this grief that does need to be processed and we want to be able to help through that. Or disenfranchised grief, where that this grief does not even get acknowledged. It gets swept under the rug or doesn't even get um, validated by any of the social norms. It is just a sense of like, well, it happened, forget about it, move on. No, you cannot do that. Disenfranchised grief is real and we must acknowledge it and it must be validated, validated and acknowledged. And that's where we would wanna to get to that point on a community level where we're having difficulty with trust. And that happens also for us in the healthcare system, but even um, broader than that. And then of course, um, on a community level, sometimes that, that oppression that gets pushed within. And so um, that external perception and the racialization gets pushed within and that oppression within. And those are the things that we are working towards that we really wanna help our communities and our patients with. So a little bit more about in the exam room. So as we think about this, we understand the history. We need to understand our community's history. We need to understand historical and generational and intergenerational trauma. And now we really wanna do have these conversations with our patients in the exam room. What do we need to make sure we do? Well, you can actually utilize a trauma-informed care model too, even in this capacity sometimes because it can be traumatic. Um, there's a recent article I actually just uh, found this, this week, um, just yesterday, I was doing some reading and there was an article talking about um, the impact on uh, of racism on black women and neural responses. And the fact that it actually does impact the fear um, 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 inhibitions and fear and how it's triggering that. And they actually see the responses and the neural responses about these repeated experiences of trauma and how this is impacting them. And so these are real things that we're seeing now and we can actually see the evidence around that. So this is just one model and one framework that you can consider um, around having conversations in the exam room when you do bring it up. Um, and I would say, just to say, it's not about what's wrong with you. It's about, help me understand, right? What has occurred with you? What are those experiences that you have had? How has it impacted you? Where can we partner together to be able to move forward? I wanna listen and be a partner with you to make you the healthiest possible. But that trauma-informed approach is also acknowledgement. You've gotta acknowledge that this has happened and that you have this um, sense of what's happened for your patient in the past and the present. And you really need that to be also um, uh, an overall perspective. And the goals for trauma-informed care is to realize that the widespread impact of trauma, understand it's a, it's a path to recovery. There's nothing instant here. And one of the things I also wanna to recognize to you is that just as we address other, other illnesses, people are in different stages of change or wanting to be able to have the conversation. Not everybody's ready to have the conversation, but if you can at least create the space so that it may be the third visit, it may be the 10th visit, it may be the first visit, that they wanna have the conversation about my experiences of racism and how it's impacted me, right? And so just be ready to just set the table and, and just be able to say, I'm here when you're ready. 
But realizing that and affirming that is gonna be important. Recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma, just as we recognize the trauma of other things, realizing that, okay, we're used to things where we have people that have had a very specific trauma and we may recognize the depression, anxiety, we may recognize certain responses that we see from our patient. All of us may have had some of those experiences where you're, you're with a patient and you're thinking, something's not quite right. This is, I'm triggering something here. It could very well be related to something around those experiences um, that they've had around race or um, race and racism. So um, just recognize those signs and symptoms we talked about earlier with patients, families, and our own staff, because they may also be triggered. And then integrate the knowledge about that into your policies, procedures, and practices. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that um, coming up. And, and then we're just gonna avoid re-traumatization. It's not about, you know, we don't wanna sweep things under the rug. We don't wanna say that, well, you know, it could have been just a different time or that was not their intent. We never wanna justify it. We just wanna listen and we're not trying to re-traumatize. We are here to just basically say, I hear you, I understand you. Where can we go? What are the steps we wanna to take together to be able to move this forward? These are just some core principles I just wanted to put out there for you so you understand some of our core principles of trauma-informed approach. So safety, we talked about that. So that needs to start from the moment they pick up the phone, right? That is not just about walking in the door. How do you create a safe space? So that's gonna take some training, right, of our staff too, of having that and making sure they recognize that. But it has to be throughout the organization that patients and staff feel physically and psychologically safe. And then also making sure that trustworthiness and transparency, that we are there to build trust. And then also if there are support systems that are there for our patients and our staff, that we wanna connect them to that. Or maybe if they're not, do we build those? There are some actual wonderful um, things out there in terms of tools looking at affinity, um, affinity tools and affinity groups even for our staffing and, and our patients to be able to help them process some of that and facilitate some of those um, support systems. So think about what those need to look like. And then of course, collaboration. So we have to acknowledge those power differentials too. And so we wanna make sure we're not utilizing power differentials, we're keep on the same playing field and that we're trying to support a shared decision-making model. We wanna empower our patients and our staff and utilize the strengths. That's why knowing your team, knowing your community and your patients and resources and building upon those strengths are gonna be so critical because that's where you wanna also be able to reinforce the idea of resilience and the ability to heal from trauma. And then of course, bringing understanding our own, our cultural humility we talked about and being responsive to that. So recognizing our own biases and stereotypes we bring to that and then understanding the historical trauma. Ask those questions within your own communities and own um, groups to be able to understand and recognize and address those. Uh, I just want to throw this out there because I love this. One of my uh, wonderful former colleagues, I think, is with you guys too, Dr. Catalina Triana. We used to love to do uh, motivational interviewing work together, and, and she taught me a lot too, and I just love doing this work in practice. And many of you probably already incorporate a lot of the concepts of motivational interviewing, but I just think it applies to everything that we do, and it can apply to how we have this conversation. So just remember, this is sometimes a dance with your patients. You have to follow their lead. And so... If they're not ready, it's okay. We're just there in that moment with them. We're in that moment with them. But if they're taking you someplace, it's already follow them, follow their lead. It's about partnership and accepting them where they are in the moment they are, that compassion that we bring forward and then evoking that even more where we're asking those questions and we're affirming. The other thing is just utilizing simple motivational interviewing um, concepts like ORs, asking those open questions, right? Allowing them to tell their story in their own words, not leading them in any direction. I wanna learn more about you beyond your medical problems. And I wanna be partners with you to take the best care of you. Some find that their race, their religion, or the culture is important to their health. What are your thoughts about this? What are your experiences around race, racism, your experiences in your community right now that you feel are affecting your health or have affected your health? Open those questions, let them lead and tell the story. Affirmations, and then as they're doing that saying, yeah, if I were in your shoes, boy, you have managed so well. I don't know if I could manage so well. Acknowledge the pain, acknowledge the resilience, acknowledge the strengths that they bring. So affirming what you hear and then reflecting. So, so you feel this way. It sounds like you have experienced this. You're probably wondering, I'm hearing this and then summarizing it, right? To say, I want to make sure that I fully understand what you're saying. And I may not understand everything, but here's what I've heard. What are you, is this, is this, uh, um, 
is this accurate with what you're saying? Is this the way? How do we want to move forward? What are the things and your goals you'd like to see us move forward? And we can continue these conversations throughout. So just keeping that space, and this is just one tool you can always use. And it really aligns with the nice trauma-informed care. It's the same kind of model that you can utilize by just recognizing it in primary care. So you screen for it. You want to be calm, empathetic as we are ask about those exposures to trauma, acknowledge that it's hard to disclose this. It's so hard to have these conversations. I want to walk this walk with you. We are together in this. Uh, the patient may disclose when they're comfortable. It may not be at that moment, but maybe later. And then understanding the health effects so that realization, right? And empowering them about that and their behaviors. And then making sure that um, they understand that they're in control of their care and health and that you're a partner in that decision with them and sharing that sharing the next steps with them. And then of course, emphasizing emotional safety and avoiding those triggers. So making sure if you're seeing that, name the name and I see that this is bringing up some emotions for you. I respect that. Um, we can pause at this moment if we need to. It's, it's up to you. It's that dance. Allow them to actually lead you so we're not re-traumatizing to and we're caring for them. And then of course, acknowledge their resilience the knowledge that they have been through all of this and what you are doing in your own spaces to be able to do this um, and focus on those positive aspects and how we wanna help you improve and how you have managed so well in these areas and how we wanna do that. So create the space, allow for the timing. And um, just as we do, um, just make sure the patient leads and we do a shared decision. All right. Uh, so that's a little bit about just um, talking about that racism, specifically having those conversations, where do we put that in there, and realizing that racism does impact our health outcomes. I want to just talk a little bit, if we're talking about health equity, we cannot go without talking about social determinants of health, right? We do this every day. This is just a way for us to remember that this is also a part that we do in our exam rooms of addressing social determinants of health. We need to know what they are, identify the risk. And, and then how that impacts our patients. And then we need to make sure we have the resources in place that we connect our patients to. And then hopefully organizationally, we start building some ways. And I'll just talk a little bit about how we're trying to approach some of this right now. I know how some practices are embedding some of this into their electronic medical record too, how they start the conversation around social determinants and those impacts on their health from even before, from the intake. It may be through, through a patient portal system where they're able to answer some questions. It may be on paper when they come in, or it may be when you're doing the intake, when you're in the exam room. But there are different ways you can gauge that. And one of the things I always want to urge you is never assume that um, social determinants of health are solely based on social socioeconomic status experiences, okay? Because, uh, you know, one of the things that I was just fascinated by just recently and just, you know, enlightened by is that even now, like our caregiving teams throughout the hospital and everything that we're dealing with in the last year, uh, some of our folks are dealing with some, so, um, some risks around social determinants of health. And, and I think we have to make sure that we create that safe space for us to have those conversations with everybody. And, and we'll talk a little bit how to do that. So just remember, health disparities are driven by social and economic inequities. <clears throat> There's things that we have from the economic side you see there, the neighborhood and physical environment. So housing, how that plays a role, employment, income, education playing a role, food, of course, food insecurities are very in access to healthy options. Our community, safety of our own communities, exposure to violence, which we've talked about, and racism, those are things that are gonna be important, but also what are those social um, support systems that are there? And of course, healthcare system. Uh, how are we covered? Uh, I know that's a, a, a big one for me too, just coverage for patients and how we make sure everyone is covered and gets access to the care that they absolutely need to be their absolutely healthiest best. So just a real reminder that, um, you know, what we do in the exam room is important, but it's only 20% of health outcomes, okay? So clinical care is important, access, quality of care, so we do need to focus on that, but recognize that health behaviors are another 30%, but the whole social determinants of health and the physical environment accounts for 50% of our outcomes of, of health. And so it's important for us not to neglect our physical determinants, social determinants, and even some of the political determinants of health as we do this work. And so we'll talk about how we can just make sure we're accessing that information, which I think would be important. So accessing your own counting information around where they rank and what those factors are is important. This is a great conceptual model I like um, around social determinants of health and primary care. Uh, this is um, Dr. Jen, uh, Jennifer Defoe and, and Dr. Um, Andrew Bazemore and colleagues um, put this out there a few years ago. 
But I like it because it's a way of thinking about how we embed this into the primary care. So we're thinking about still within our exam room as we've had the conversations, and then we also have to understand the social determinants and health equity and health disparities. We need to understand the community. And so the vital signs of the community. So make sure that we have that data, whether it's census data, community um, county health rankings, um, any data that you have. Some of you uh, may have your community health needs assessment, which is great. If you have not had access to community health needs assessment, your hospital has that, you should make sure you have that so you can see what that entails. Incorporating that, seeing what those highest risk areas are in terms of your community health needs. And then of course, then there's the patient reported data. That's where I'm talking about being able to access that data directly from their patients in terms of what their specific needs are, maybe around education, housing, food, employment, things like that, and how do we get that? And then how do we put that into a way of managing our own panel of patients so we get a broader picture of that? But then on the individual level of the point of care is taking that information and ensuring that we're addressing it with our patients directly in that primary care workflow and that we're connecting them to the services and to the resources that they need to be able to address that social determinant of health area of risk and need. Uh, this is just another summary. You may decide how you wanna put that into your, um, your electronic medical record or your workflow. Maybe there are certain categories that you'll decide whatever those risk categories that you know that you see mostly in your own practices. Um, for us, some of that is housing, uh, utility, food, um, education. And so these are different areas that we have identified um, sometimes as risk categories, but you may identify also as some risk categories. And then within the, the um, and this for us, we utilize EPIC. Uh, and so thinking about what are some of those things you can actually embed into the electronic health record to be able to get that data. So um, as you see, there's some of those that we already collect, but then some of the other things we wanna collect in terms of the new, uh, social determinants of health and utilizing our tools there are things around education, finances, that, um, uh, stress, housing, whatever it is that you feel that you think you need to make sure that you're collecting so that you can actually address it. Uh, and so, yeah, you can, like I said, utilize different models. So it could be when you're doing your vitals or take your intake there. It could be before they get there. If you have a patient portal, like we have my chart and they do a pre-visit form or you can ask some of these questions. You don't have that as every question. It just can be basic questions on those areas of risk. You could have it where the patients do it in the room or you could do it with the, the medical assistant or the nurse or with the physician themselves. Um, it's important just to make sure you're getting that information, summarizing it. Um, it could be, like I said, in a paper form, or it could also be um, directly clicking it into your electronic medical record. This is an example of a social needs questionnaire. So this may talk about education. This may also talk about food, housing, and then giving you a little bit more specific of what the needs are. And I would just urge you, like I said, don't assume that everybody is just okay with everything. So it's just making it really just a safe place to be able to um, have these conversations and get, get this data from our patients. This is a way that you can see it's actually within Epic that we do it. There's an actual tab there. It's the same questions that you see there on paper here actually um, in the electronic medical record. So if they answer yes to anything, then you can see it highlighted. And then when you as the clinician or physicians coming in there, you can actually see it and then you can say, hey, and then have the conversation with the patient around those specific healthcare needs. And hopefully you can figure out whatever systems you have in place or other ways to be able to connect them to resources and to be able to have ongoing conversations with them. So if it is a food insecurity, like you see here, often true, there are things you wanna make sure you're having a conversation. Um, I would just say, you know, it's just some tips around having these conversations. I know people will be like, well, I don't wanna talk about these things and things like that. Make sure we use inclusive language, right? And so it's just that we understand the importance of health. You know, it starts long before we get ill. It starts about where we live, we learn, we work, we play. And I want you to have the opportunity, we want you to have, we want to have the opportunity of our best lives. And so in our best and healthiest lives, and that begins in our neighborhoods. I had, you know, we see here that um, uh, some challenges around um, access to food. Um, let's talk about that and how we can help you um, achieve that for yourself in the best way. Also remember, um, use person first languages. So we always like to remember, we don't like to tell people that, you know, they're a diabetic. We say as a person living with diabetes, we know it's important where you live and you work and how your access to food. We want you to be the healthiest you can as, um, as a person living with diabetes, where here are some opportunities we can talk about to help you with those things you need. And I would always remember, like we just talked about too, with racism is just listening attentively and listening to understand acknowledgement and just partnering. 
this is just a way you may have this. Sometimes you may have certain things that are already in your system there and you can connect them based on the healthcare, the social determinant of need and the healthcare need there. Um, but I just wanted to just remind you guys that the AAFP, the American Academy of Family Physicians, also has a great tool. Um, I get into this tool sometimes too. It's called the Everyone Project Neighborhood Navigator. You can just put in your zip code for that patient and it pulls up all this amazing resources that are just broadly based out on the social determinants of health. And it's just a great tool that you can also utilize. Similarly here, this used to be the Aunt Bertha, now it's the findhelp.org. And so I think I plugged in one of your uh, zip codes here and it was so great to see all of these like 2000, almost 3000 programs pop up. And then you can click on any of these tabs, whether it's about food, housing, um, health, um, um, childcare, education, and you can see what those resources are in your own area. So it's sometimes just an easy thing you can do to connect them immediately and then make sure you're following through with that with your patients. So I talked a lot about what's in the exam room. So let's talk a little bit about just real quickly beyond the exam room and what's the framework I'd like to just help you. Well, I like to think about four Ps. So what are we doing to take action as family physicians, primary care physicians here in healthcare, all of us as clinicians in healthcare? Well, I remember I mentioned to you partnerships. So building partnerships is critical. We cannot do this alone. We cannot do this alone. Building partnerships is so critical. You need to identify those organizations and businesses that are actively engaged right now in the work of anti-racism. Uh, and so that they're doing this active work. So you may be able to engage in the public health agencies, governmental agencies, police departments. I am telling you, people are sometimes a little hesitant to engage in the police departments. There are police departments that want our help as, as healthcare clinicians to be able to have these conversations so that they can really help to realize the impact. They wanna know more, they wanna learn more. So you may be surprised, but police departments, I will tell you, would be a great way also to engage. Schools, having those conversations. Faith-based groups and organizations are wonderful too to also engage. I mentioned to you about community advisory boards, the one that I worked with that was actually very involved in research, community participant community participatory research, and then patient advisory boards. But the partnerships are important, also knowing your elected officials and so that you can partner in this active work. So I would say, identify those partners and engage with those partners. And not just once, but longitudinally and throughout. Policy. So you've got to address and change policy. So I would say this is sometimes the hardest work and this is probably the most long-term work that it takes, right? What are your policies for your organization when staff are subjected to discrimination, prejudice, bias, or racism from patients or other, right? Do you understand what those are? So make sure you're looking at that. We're actually gonna be doing that active work. It's gonna be part of our strategic plan moving forward. I was um, very uh, vocal <laughs> about that. And I think um, we have a lot of great partners that are gonna be looking at um, assessing our own policies um, um, for our organization and then really engaging. And as you're doing that, not only you're looking at your local, state, and national policies and those practices that are negatively affecting or disadvantaging people of color, make sure that also you engage people of color, right, or the disenfranchised group into the process of developing policy. And make sure that we all have, of course, the defined goal of eliminating the gap due to racism and health equity. But it's important to, if you don't change policy and you don't address that, nothing ever persists and is sustainable. You must address policies. So partnerships are critical and you need those partnerships also as you're uh, addressing policy and changing policy. Practice, so this is some of the things I talked about, your own practices. So we talked a little bit about what to do in the exam room. This is beyond the exam room. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but. Reflect on your own practices, right? Seek to understand the experiences of your patients, the legacy of the community I talked about. Make sure you're implementing an implicit bias training for your whole healthcare team and keep those ongoing conversations and accountability, those huddles, make sure you're having space for those conversations and ensure workforce diversity. If you don't have a workforce that looks like your patients or at all, yeah, there's an issue there, right? Go back to your policies, hiring practices, everything else that you need to look at and ensure there's workforce diversity. You've got to change your practice. And also investigate, investigate your patient outcomes, right? Make sure you're reflectively looking at your own quality of care and your, your own quality improvement. So look at your patient outcomes. Is there a disparity there in my own practice that I'm not even aware of? Look at the data. And then you can identify those root causes and start doing some actual work. And that's where you can do some quality improvement analyses to make sure you don't have certain potential areas of biases that you may have in your own practices that you're not aware of. And then I would say the last P I like is positioning 
or advocacy. I have a passion for advocacy, so I have to just put this out there. And just remember, you got to leverage positions, understanding that politics drive policy. I know some of us don't like the word politics, but just understand politics drive policy. So advocate for policies that drive health equity. If, if that's happening at your local, state, national level, just make sure that you're part of that conversation. Remember, your leadership matters. What you do in healthcare matters. You are seen as leaders within health systems, school boards, city councils, all these other places. And even your federal and your state and local legislators, they wanna hear from you. Remember, you are the expert in your field. So your voice matters, advocate for what you think is important and advocate for our patients and our communities. So just remember partnerships, right? To change those policies, address those policies for sure. Make sure we're looking at our own practices, what we're doing in our exam rooms and with our own team members and what we're doing there. And then of course, positioning ourselves and leveraging those positions around advocacy and remember that politics do drive policy. I think I went through that Dr. Venner. So I would love to be able to, uh, uh, I have some resources I'll share with you later and you can have this, I'll send this to um, the group, but I'm open to any questions. Wow. Thank you, Tricia. That has been an amazing and inspirational talk. I doubt that you had time to read the comments while you were talking, but they were also really positive and generative. Um, uh, we don't have very much time for, uh, for, for questions. So I think what I'm going to do is just pick one, although I will point out that there, that I would encourage everyone to just read through them because there's some great comments from Michael Reyes about the work that's being done with the Pacific AETC around trauma-informed mm. care. Oh, and um, uh, Jay had some great comments about um, gender-affirming care to BIPOC folks and oh, Wolf yeah. had great comments about um, asking about financial strain. But I think just in the interest of time, I'm gonna just pick out one um, uh, from Lee Kimberg who, um, who talked about your use of the word mind-body, the term mind-body-spirit um, and uh, just asked a little bit about how how do you discuss the mind body spirit impacts of racism with parent with patients sorry and colleagues um, and uh, how do you use this to discuss uh, structural racism embodied in ourselves and our relationships with patients and colleagues um, and then one of the questions that Kevin added to that was is this you know is this something that you ask proactively or is this something that you wait for a patient to initiate i realize this is a gigantic topic but um <laughs> it just seems so important that it felt like it was worth asking you in the final moment and i'll put you on the spot absolutely no worries at all uh yeah you know what i do i'll just talk a little bit about the mind body spirit piece that, just real quickly at first that i do i I really normalize that in my own practice and really being able to have those conversations with patients because I will say that we are, we are, we are not just a being of just our bodies, right? Everything that we take in, everything that we see, everything that we experience impacts our ability to be our best, our healthiest. And so what I try to also is frame for our patients is understanding that um, our mind, the health of our mind impacts the health of our body. And you can just give them examples, you know, think about those times when you're not feeling your best, or this is just not, you're, you're having some struggles there, or spiritually, you're feeling just in struggles and you're feeling um, those experiences there, how you're feeling, you know, tap into what you're feeling physically. And a lot of times when you sit, you, you do that for patients, you're like, yeah, I feel really bad. Like my body feels bad when those things are out of alignment. And so it's all that whole thing about mindfulness too, right? So just thinking about just how am I going to be, be on purpose in the moment without judgment for myself and being mindful. So, you know, I think it's normalizing that mind, body, spirit connection. And then I, I sometimes will share my own experiences. And I think we can share our own experiences no matter how we self-identify, right? I think it's about sharing where we're struggling and things like that. And I have, I have talked about my episodes where I feel that, and I'll joke sometimes like my sister and I will have these conversations that I'm having a little PTSD moment there and I'll go back to a childhood moment where there was some racism and I would say, and I did not realize it or I'll be, in, I'll be with a group that are wonderful people and friends that I'm with and then I'm thinking like, why am I feeling right now in my spirit a little unsettled? And then I'll go back to my senses like, because I remember in a moment when I was where I was where there was a negative experience that I had. And that's what's triggering me even like 40 years later. Okay, so I think being open as your own physician, as a physician or clinician to with your patients about your own experiences is important. And, and to uh, Kevin's point too, I will say, um, open the space. And like I said, it's a dance. So sometimes I will say, and especially if something's very, very prominent right now, 
uh, in the media and things. It's like, boy, it's been a rough week or a lot of things are happening. How are you feeling right now? What are your thoughts around that? Is this something you feel like you'd like to talk about right now? If not, I'd love, we, I'm here for you to talk about that at any moment, but it does impact the way that we are able to engage with others, have relationships, how to be able to get, be our healthiest in our mind and our body and our spirit. How's your spirit feeling right now with all of this? And I will have those conversations and I'll follow their lead. And if it's not the space or time, I have at least created this, the, the opening and the timing for it and they can, they can lead. Wow, I really, I really appreciate your being willing to delve into these profound and difficult, but also um, really generative topics with us. I, I wrote down when you were speaking at the very beginning, quote, listen to understand. I put that like right front and center in my actually mm -hmm. calendar for today. I, I think in some ways, if I had to pick one sort of phrase out of this um, that I will undoubtedly uh, try to remember for a long time, I think for me, it was that phrase and also your openness and willing to engage on topics that I think are are challenging. Um, there's some really positive comments in the Q and A, and I apologize that I can't oh, um, uh, that I don't have the technology ability to make those be visible. But I'm hoping the tech team can fix that for us somehow. <laughs> Mostly, they're just really thanking you for your insight and your wisdom. Uh, and um, I so much appreciate your being here today. I'm going to give you the stage to end on any final note or comment that you want. And the last thing I have to say is just thank you from all of us. Oh. Dr. Well, thank you. And I know I went very quickly and I was telling Dr. Venner like this can, be, you know, I think what I've been inspired about this is even to think about putting this into even more of a workshop where we can actually practice some of this and, and do this work together at some point in the future, I would hope, because there are other people doing this work I want to bring to the table. And I'm not going to even say I'm the expert in this. This is just something that I'm passionate about. And and um, definitely have been um, thrust forward. I will just tell you, um, and this is just not just more to come. We do have an anti-racism task force for the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine that we just started. And some of this work, and we've been um, learning a lot more about what's happening out there with our wonderful um, folks doing this work. And I'm hoping that more will come out of that over the next um, months and years, and we're gonna share that. And um, including just how we, we bond together, everyone together. Um, how important allyship is, in, is, is for this, and then um, how do we care for each other to be able to care for our patients even better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Elliott. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We hope the work continues together. Thanks, everyone. So, are we able to like chat among us now? <laughs> <laughs>